What is up, A Push? It's Mr. Hill. Um, we are getting into Unit 3, which is testable college board content. It's also one of my favorite units. We get to talk about Georgie Wash and the revolution. So let's get going. Let's do this. Um, and let's discuss our A Push review. Um, okay. So from the start, um, our time period is 1754 to 1800. Why is that significant? 1754 is the start of the French and Indian War, which is a game changer on the North American continent. France, Britain, going at it head to head. The colonies are sucked in. What happens and what effects are going to happen to our American colonists? Um, we end in 1800, which is the transfer of power. That is Thomas Jefferson being elected president in his first presidency, the transfer from Federalists to our Democratic Republicans, um, and a peaceful transfer of power. Um, what is the College Board saying? We have to know in this unit the British imperial attempts to reassert control over its colonies and the colonial reaction is going to produce a new American republic along with the struggles of over the new nation's social, political, and economic identity. So what it's saying here is that after our French and Indian War as the catalyst, we're going to see the British imperial attempt to reassert control, which means we're going to try to you know, send in um, British royal governors. We're going to try to enforce taxes upon you. And the colonial reaction is not good. Um, that produces a new American republic. And then once we have this new American republic, of course, first under the Articles of Confederation, how do we establish a new nation, social, political, and economic identity? Uh, we're going to have lots of founding fathers imprints over that, Alexander Hamilton and Washington and Madison, of course, and all these things. All right, so what are our key themes and dates for this time period? Um, the French and Indian War leads to the end of salutary neglect. We have been neglected by the British as the, um, the British crown allowed the colonies to pretty much rule themselves politically with their own colonial governments. And even though there was an attempt through mercantilism and the Nav Navigation Acts to force the colonies to follow specific guidelines of trade, in fact, this was largely unenforced as Britain had much to do in its own politics. Um, that is going to end with the French and Indian War, and there will be much more heavy-handed rule of the American colonies. Um, unfortunate for Britain that this just comes at the wrong time in history, because with the Enlightenment, these new ideas of thinking with John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and Voltaire and Montesquieu and all these great thinkers promoting natural rights and the limited amount of the power of government, um, that our American colonists are going to feel as though they have the rights um, to rule themselves and to rebel. And, and, and then with the British increased economic and political control of the colonies, that's going to lead to the Revolutionary War. Um, the two things that we'll discuss next um, lecture will be the New Republic, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, uh, federalism, separation of powers, and the Three-Fifths Compromise, as well as our first political parties. Um, the three key dates from this time period that we need to know, 1754 to 1763, that's the French and Indian War. We've got Lexington and Concord in 1775, that's when our Revolutionary War begins, of course, and then 1788 when the Constitution is ratified. Um, we've got some must-know terms. Uh, you look at this um, list every time that you look at a unit review and you should be able to say, I can define each and every one of these terms. These are terms that are listed by the College Board as must-know terms, meaning that you may have documents or questions that uh, assume that you know um, the impact and knowledge of these things. Okay, um, our first key concept is Britain's victory over France in the imperial struggle for North America led to new conflicts among the British government, the North American colonists, the American Indians. Okay, so when it says Britain's victory over France in the imperial struggle for North America, right away you're thinking, oh, of course, that just means the French and Indian War. But no, Koa, there's much more to it than that. Let's start with a little context. Uh, 1608, we have Quebec founded. That's one year after Jamestown. We've got the leader Samuel de Champlain, or the father of New France. This was really one of the only permanent settlements in the New World for the French. The French, as we know, 
were not there to stay permanently or empire build. They, like the British initially, were looking to make some wealth off of the North American continent. And what they found up there in Canada was furs, uh, especially the beaver furs. And so they are going to engage in a um, large scale trade of the beaver. Um, that, of course, is going to have them become very friendly with Native American societies that also hunted the beaver, primarily, of course, not for large scale trade, but um, for their pelts, for, for use in their everyday life. Um, Samuel de Champlain, in relation to Native Americans, is going to make a very fateful decision um, for France because Samuel de Champlain, when he arrives, is going to befriend the Huron tribe. And the Huron tribe was. Um, deep enemies and long-standing enemies with the Iroquois. And because Samuel de Champlain befriends the Hurons, um, this is going to make an enemy of the Iroquois that um, is most of the Iroquois um, will resent this decision um, by Samuel de Champlain and the French. Um, now, the, the French, because of the beaver trade, the fur trade, are going to make semi-permanent forts all throughout the North American continent. We can see especially up there in Canada, but also as they come down um, through the middle of the continent, through the middle of North America in this region right here called the Ohio River Valley. Why is this region so prominent? You'll notice that these forts that pop up are along rivers and tributaries that connect with the Mississippi. The all-important Mississippi, guys, is the lifeline for the French. Because when you have this trade like this and you're hunting all of these beavers, the only way that you're going to get wealth from them is by being able to export them to either the West Indies down here or back to Europe. And so to do that, you need to come down the Mississippi through Louisiana and the port at New Orleans and then sail off from there. And so very importantly was this move by Robert de la Salle, where he floated down the Mississippi in 1682 and claimed New Orleans as the key port here. Um, this area right here, the Ohio River Valley, is doing then two very important things. It is stopping English expansion west, and it's also connecting all of these forts together into one economic system that runs through the port of New Orleans. That means that there is an inevitable conflict coming as British westward expansion and the French standing firm is going to cause some conflicts. And in fact, there's lots of conflicts that occur before the big one, the French and Indian War. Um, just another way to look at this map, the English, of course, in green, the French, um, throughout lots of Canada and, and the Ohio River Valley. And then of course the Spanish still very prevalent in the Americas at this stage and controlling um, Florida. Okay, so several different wars um, between uh, Britain and France coming up through um, the end of the 17th century and the 18th century. We actually have four different wars. We have King William's War, we have Queen Anne's War, uh, we have the War of Jenkins Ear, and then we have the French and Indian War. Um, Spain and France at this time period, um, families, the, the same family members ruling over the thrones of these um, countries, um, they are going to be working together. They're going to be constant allies, the French and the Spanish. Um, and we see many different wars in which the French and the English start fighting and then Spain joins in on the side of the French. Um, Queen Anne's War is one of the biggest uh, examples of this. Now, in all of these initial skirmishes before the French and Indian War, um, they're going to start overseas. They're going to start in Europe. They're going to start somewhere else besides the Americas. And fighting will make its way to the Americas. But because the American colonies at that stage are so young, um, they don't, aren't seen as important enough to send over the regular troops, to send over the redcoats, or to send over you know, the Navy. Um, instead, it's mostly guerrilla warfare over in the Americas. We see either both sides trying to recruit, recruit Native Americans to fight for them. Um, but as I said, most of the fighting is taking place overseas. For instance, Queen Anne's War becomes the War of Spanish Secession. It's Britain versus France. And the British win with that awesome Navy and they gain Nova Scotia from France. And they also get trading rights in Spanish North America. And then the British are attempting to trade um, in Spanish America when a tax collector boards a British ship um, and demands taxes. The British refuse to, to pay those taxes. 
the Spanish uh, tax collector cuts off the ear of one of the British merchants and hands it back to him and says, take this back to your master who, if he were here, I would serve in like fashion. So of course, very dramatically, the British merchant returns back to England and says, they cut off my ear, the Spanish cut off my ear, and this leads to the War of Jenkins' ear, which merges back in Europe with the War of Austrian Secession and once again plunges the continent into war. But these initial conflicts, once again, um, are very secondarily fought in North America. Um, in fact, only some of the colonies uh, get involved. Only the colonies closest to the fighting get involved, really, as most of the time the conflict is fought in Europe. Um, but that changes, of course, with the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, is going to start in the Americas. And the biggest reason why is because the French are controlling that ever important Ohio River Valley seen in blue um, right here throughout the center of North America. And they have these chain of forts there that is thwarting British westward expansion. Um, the problem, however, is that the American colonies are starting to look to that land as their land. And in fact, Virginia, um, still employing the head right system at this stage, is continually promising more and more acreage of land to the rich Virginia planters, including the Washingtons. In fact, um, 500,000 acres of land have been promised um, to Virginia families in that Ohio River Valley. And so finally, the Virginia families, the wealthy families are gonna send in a 21 year old George Washington to come into this land and claim it for the Virginians. Um, when this occurs, George Washington and his men are going to run into um, a French um, small brigade. This fighting is going to ensue. Uh, the Virginians win this battle, and when they do so, they scatter. Uh, the French scatter, and so Washington is going to try to hold the land. He's going to build up um, a fort out of necessity to protect himself and the Virginians. This is called Fort Necessity. Um, however, the French return with a much larger force and force uh, Washington to surrender. Um, he is allowed to retreat back to Virginia, um, but the fighting and the war has begun. Um, this is going to rage through all seven seas around the world, um, and the colonists are going to need to get ready because in all previous engagements with the French, only the colonies close to the shooting have sent reinforcements. Um, and so there is an attempt to try and get um, the colonies united in being able to fight against the French and the Spanish and their Indian allies. So the British government, the actual crown is going to call um, the colonies to come together um, and unite in the defense of the colonies. Um, and we are gonna see that not all colonies are gonna come in and come to this Albany Congress, which is um, a big um, pattern that ensues in the 18th century, the 1700s, where our colonies can't seem to get on the same page as far as coming together. Um, but this Albany Con Congress also has some other goals. Um, and the biggest and the short-term purpose is making sure that the Iroquois stay loyal to the British as an important ally against the French. Um, ben Franklin, um, months before, a month before this Albany Congress is supposed to um, meet, is going to publish a very famous cartoon, his most famous cartoon in the Pennsylvania Gazette, um, which tried to get all of the colonies to come in and unite together, join or die, of course, and says, come in and uh, meet with us at this Albany Congress. Um, and yes, Daniel Bellsberg, you're wondering why is the Albany Congress, why meet in Upper New York? If you're trying to get all of the colonies to come together, why not meet in a more central location? Um, why Albany? Um, well, the answer, of course, is that is Iroquois territory. And this is a way in which the colonists can come together and bribe the Iroquois. They give them 30 wagon loads worth, worth of goods, including guns, um, to try and keep the Iroquois loyal. Um, and they come up with this plan, and Ben Franklin especially comes up with something called the Albany Plan, which gives, would have given the colonies um, more decision-making power in foreign affairs. Um, the Crown still claims that it has all of the foreign policy decision-making power, meaning that if they went to war with France, that the Crown could order 
each colony to assemble a militia and go in and fight. And Ben Franklin says, we need to be able to rule ourselves. We know much more of our military capacities. We need to be able to make decisions on the fly and not wait for military orders to come in from 3,000 miles away. And so he proposes this Albany plan where the colonies would work together and all of the delegates at the Albany Congress actually agree with it and return back to their colonies to propose it to their colonial legislatures like the House of Burgesses or the General Court, um, but it's rejected. It's rejected by the colonies when it makes, makes it back because our colonial legislatures say, ah, we're still too dependent on, on Britain. We don't have enough independence for ourselves. And the British say it's too much independence. You, you shouldn't have self-rule. We should be able um, to tell you what to do. And so the Albany Congress, its short-term purpose works in keeping the Iroquois loyal to the British, but its long-term purpose did not because we still have colonial disunity. And then, of course, the French and Indian War. Um, in the beginning, the British are going to send over the wizened old general, General Braddock. And General Braddock's 60 years old. He is a, um, a classic European-style general, um, line up in lines, um, bring in the cannons. Um, and he is very... Um, He's not very well equipped for fighting in North America. He's never been in North America, um, and there are forests everywhere. There's hills. There's rivers. This is not the well developed, well developed um, Britain. And because of this, um, he is going to be routed in battle after battle after battle. Um, the French and its Indian allies are going to continue to defeat the English, and it's only until they turn to William Pitt. Um, that things change because William Pitt is going to uh, remove Braddock of his position and bring in um, James Wolfe, who is going to um, make a very, very daring exploit, climbing the cliffs of Quebec and setting up the most important battle of this war, the Battle of Quebec, the French facing off with the British. And in this battle, the British are successful and kick the French off the North American continent. This is one of the most important battles in American history because now that the French have been kicked out, the British now completely control the eastern side of the United States. Um, and we have a peace treaty in 1763. If you had to guess what the name of the peace treaty is, of course, it's the Treaty of Paris. Um, Great Britain acquires all of French Canada up here. Um, it's also going to see the French are going to cede Louisiana to Spain. So now Spain is over here controlling New Orleans. Um, France has kicked off the continent and now Great Britain has unchallenged control in North America. And our American colonists feel the same way. Our American colonists are now saying, okay, we got rid of that pe those pesky French who were on our doorstep. We were constantly worried about them. And now we've gained all of this new land in the Ohio River Valley. And now we have access to more land that we can move into. This is wonderful. We, we don't have to worry about anything at all. Um, but they do. They do have to worry because now that this battle has been won, the war has been won by the British, there is a major shift in London's policies towards the colonists. Um, it was very expensive, 140 million pounds in debt, in fact, the British now are after this French and Indian War. In fact, after all four wars against the French in this short time span, and there needs to be money to be able to pay that back. And so the first thing that happens is that taxes are raised in England, that the English people are having to pay more. Um, but the English people, understandably so, are going to say, well, why are we paying all of these extra taxes to be able to defend um, the American colonies, if they're not paying taxes to us. And so, understandably, the British leaders, including King George III and, and the Prime Minister at the time, um, George Granville, is going to say that, yes, the colonies do need to help pay for England's debts. This is going to set a massive shift in the treatment of the American colonies by the British. This is the end of salutary neglect. We are now enforcing the Navigation Act. Um, also, King George is gonna say, we need to keep these American colonies safe so that they're able to produce wealth for us and help pay back all of this debt. And so he's gonna say, we need to have troops guarding the frontier um, so that we are able to keep these American colonies safe, but troops need to be paid. 
And so um, we're going to pass some royal taxes on the colonists to help pay for these troops on the frontier. The first one will be the Sugar Act, um, which, of course, is going to be met with lots of hostility in the American colonies. Um, but there is something that almost seems to to show Britain um, and the British leaders that what they're doing um, by having this home guard is correct. And that's something called Pontiac's Rebellion. Um, after now this new land has been awarded to Britain in the Ohio River Valley, just as always in American history, we see American colonists moving west. We have people moving west looking for available land and opportunity. And of course, the people living there, the Native Americans, are not going to be too happy about this. And we have an Ottawa chief named Chief Pontiac who is going to get his men together um, an attack and there's going to be a this is called pontiac's rebellion british troops have to be sent in to put down the uprising and what this does is it it, it shows king george in his own mind aha this is why we needed those troops on the front lines uh, we needed to be able to protect the colonies from things like this but from the colonist perspective they're saying look we've been dealing with native american attacks for over 100 years we under we are able to do this we can do this ourselves and so it shows this just misunderstanding between the crown and the american colonists um and this misunderstanding is especially epitomized with the proclamation of 1763 or the proclamation line of 1763 because this was that infamous law that prohibits colonists from settling west of the appalachian mountains and of course our colonists um, believe that they have earned this land they have fought for this land against the French. Um, and this, of course, is going to be the first of, of many laws that are going to deeply, deeply unsettle our American colonists against their king and against their parliament. All right, so we have these deep roots of revolution and there's lots of long-term causes um, for the revolution. Um, and one of which is the social structure of the old world compared to the new world. If you go back into the old world, um, go back to England, for instance, where most of our colonists are coming from at this stage, um, there is, England has been about the same as far as social structure for a thousand years. Um, there has been some heavy, heavy embedded feudalistic laws like primogeniture and just the, 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 the status of, um, anyone of citizens in England are going to be based upon um, their titles. Um, if you are lucky enough to be a from a Lord family that you are, you own land, you have a title, you have a high position in English standing. Um, but if you were not a Lord, um, then you were in this kind of smaller um, middle class that was certainly capped on how much money that they could make. And then lots of people are um, the the lowest of classes, the, the serfs or laser, later the free peasantry that are working on someone else's land. And because there isn't available land in England um, or really the old world in general, um, that there's a lot of unchanging circumstances. And with those unchanging circumstances, there isn't a lot of hopes for rebellion or revolution. Um, however, the new world presented this entirely different situation where we see um, people that had no future in the old world come to the new world and there was all of this possibility, land and opportunity. And in fact, there wasn't this rigid social structure in the Americas that um, anyone could come in and be a small farmer by themselves and, and make it rich and become the sort of nobility of the new world. There's limitless opportunities. There's also less government in the new world. There isn't people telling you every day what to do. In fact, living on the frontier, you might really never have to engage with any sort of law enforcement. Um, and so this is a big contrast between the new world and the old world. Um, and then, of course, there are these Enlightenment ideals. Um, with the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century, we have all of this revisiting of um, the, the governments of the ancient Greece and the, and the Romans um, with republics and democracy and with these new ideas of natural rights um, and republicanism starts to be thrown around as a, as a, a way that um, government should be run, not just in the Americas, but everywhere, um, in, in which a just society is one where its citizens um, do what is good for the state and not, as good, not what is good just for themselves. Um, and this is a belief that um, is going to embed its way into the minds of the American colonists. Um, we also have 
because of all of the turmoil that has gone through in English politics with the heavy handedness of the English monarchs um, throughout the 17th century, we now have a, a group of political commentators that call themselves the radical Whigs. And the radical Whigs are, are constantly looking at the British monarch for any uh, signs of tyranny um, or oppressing their, their citizens and citizens. Um, and these radical Whigs are political commentators that are constantly writing about things like, oh, the, the king's ministers are bribing officials over here. Um, you know, we have this corrupt political system and our American colonists are seeing this and saying, um, wow, that, that there, there is some corruption by the British monarch over there. And this is widely read by our colonists and it starts to lead towards a little bit of disloyalty towards the British monarchy. Um, of course, the Navigation Acts, contextually, we, we know the, Na the Navigation Acts by now, um, very loosely enforced beforehand. Um, and now um, we see that now the Navigation Acts are going to be enforced much more heavy handedly, um, which is going to lead to a, a big rise in smuggling. We have people like Samuel Adams and John Hancock that are going to make their fortunes off of smuggling. And if you, you know, break down these acts one more time, all commerce to and from the colonies must be on British vessels. Um, all European goods destined to the Americas had to pass through Britain first, where, of course, British middlemen are going to take a slice of the pie on that and make some money. Um, American colonists had to ship enumerated products exclusively to Britain, like tobacco, like furs, like uh, ships, masts, all of these things. Um, but now things have changed. Um, first of all, Prime Minister Grenville is going to enact much stricter enforcement of the Navigation Acts. And then we have our Sugar Act. That is the first law that is passed um, in North America for the explicit purpose of raising money from the American colonies. Um, but the Sugar Act is gonna be less unpopular than the Stamp Act. And they're a year apart, but the reason why is because the Sugar Act is just increasing duties on foreign sugar imported from the West Indies. Um, we have the French um, still in the West Indies. Um, they control um, modern day Haiti. Uh, we have the Spanish in the West Indies with Cuba, right? We have the English in the West Indies with Jamaica and Barbados. Um, if you buy sugar from Jamaica or Barbados from English controlled places, there's no tax on sugar. But if you buy from one of the other countries, then it is therefore foreign sugar and there is a duty. There is a tax on an imported good. Now, this is the British trying to make Americans buy domestic, and it's also trying to make a little money in the process. Um, but who is this mostly affecting? It's only affecting a small proportion of American society. It's especially affecting rum producers and merchants. And those are going to be people in New England. And so right from the start, our New Englanders are going to be the most frustrated with these new laws. But because it doesn't affect everybody, the Sugar Act is kind of swallowed as something that's unpleasant, but okay, we can do this. Um, however, um, then come the following year, the Quartering Act and the Stamp Act, and this is where our colonists rise up in hatred for these new laws. First of all, the Quartering Act requiring colonists to provide food and living quarters for British colonists stationed in, in the colonies, that should say British um, Redcoats Army stationed in the colonies, because um, this is largely considered unnecessary by our American colonists. Why do we need soldiers? over here in um, the New World. And then the Stamp Act, the big one where we see lots of hatred towards the Stamp Act because there needs to be a tax on any um, printed paper goods, legal documents, newspapers, pamphlets, advertisements, playing cards. Um, you needed to purchase a, ta a stamp to show that you have paid the tax. And this is a direct tax. This isn't affecting just merchants. This is affecting everyone. And that's where the frustration comes. And if you look to um, circumnavigate, get around these um, laws, 
that you could be tried in an admiralty court. And that meant that you weren't going to be tried in the colonies. Um, or if you were, you're going to be tried in the colonies by a crown appointed judge, not by a jury, by your peers. And this is something that is very illegal in Britain. Um, you needed to have a trial by jury in Britain. But what we see here is that um, the British crown is employing these new laws that are that are very tyrannical against our American colonists. Our colonial reaction is not going to be good to the Stamp Act. Um, of course, that's where our first cries of no taxation without representation occur. Uh, Grenville is going to say, oh, but you are represented. Um, and he says, by virtual representation, every member of parliament represents all British subjects, even those in the American colonies. Of course, this is hogwash to the American colonists that are saying we are not represented. The picture on your right is Patrick Henry in the House of Burgesses standing up and saying, this is wrong. We need our liberties. Give me liberty or give me death. Um, we also have three things that are going to be used to fight back against the Stamp Act. Um, the first one, the Stamp Act Congress, we have nine different colonies coming together, writing a statement to the king and parliament to repeal the act. This is largely ignored. Um, while the Stamp Act Congress shows a little bit more colonial unity, still only nine of the 13, however, um, it's ignored. It doesn't do a lot as far as political change. But what is going to create change is the economic weapons that are used against the Stamp Act, the most important being the non-importation agreements. Um, it's a boycott of British goods, especially textiles. And because the textile industry is so important in Britain, um, this is really going to hit Britain where it hurts in the wallet. Um, the Sons of Liberty and the Daughters of Liberty, very much the same way. This is a very radical group. This isn't your average colonists. These are more radical groups that are coming in and tar and feathering um, people that aren't following the non-importation agreements, meaning you're still buying British textiles. So we're going to come and make an example of you or they're going to intimidate tax collectors. Either way, it's going to enforce, it's going to hurt the British where it hurts with their wallets, and the British are going to repeal the Stamp Act. Um, America at this time was buying one-fourth of British exports. Uh, we have people losing work in Britain because they're not making any money. The Stamp Act is repealed. But Britain draws a line in the sand here when repealing the Stamp Act, and they are going to issue the Declaratory Act, which says, the British Parliament has the right to tax and make laws for the colonies in all cases whatsoever. At this stage, however, Americans rejoice. Okay, they made a mistake. No problem. We won't have to deal with this again. But they are wrong because now Grenville is out as prime minister in Britain. But a new man, Charlie Townsend, has now entered the prime minister position in Britain. And he promises to pluck the feathers from the colonial goose with a minimum of squawking. And what that means is he is going to get some taxes um, from the American colonies without the American colonies fighting back. And so he cleverly attempts to um, put in more duties, meaning taxes on imports rather than direct taxes. He, he rightly figures out that because the Stamp Act was a direct tax affecting all colonists, that perhaps if he raised taxes on tea and glass and paper, if they're imports, that that um, wouldn't be as hated by the American colonists. But the American colonists at this stage have a state of heightened awareness. They are looking for any taxes coming in and being placed upon them. And these taxes are especially hated for two reasons. One, the money that is made by these taxes are being used to pay the crown officials in the colonies. Up until this point, crown officials are still paid by our colonial legislatures who collect their own taxes from their own colonies. Um, so because of that, crown officials were very beholden of colonial legislatures, of colonial governments. They had to more or less do what the colonies said. But now this money is being used to pay crown officials. And that means that the crown officials are now listening to the crown and not the colonial legislatures. That's why the towns index are hated. And they're also hated because imports are being placed on tea. And of course, tea is consumed by virtually every American colonist at this stage. And this is going to deeply, deeply upset our, our colonists. And it's going to lead to a huge upswing in smuggling, especially for tea smuggling. 
Um, and now, because of the upswing of smuggling, we're going to see um, the British now allow the searching of private homes for smuggled goods using these really general warrants called writs of assistance, um, which allow them to enter a home and search a home without even a specific good on the warrant, saying we're just coming in and looking for any contraband um, that is going to lead our American colonists to cry that their civil liberties are being infringed upon. Um, the height of smuggling is taking place in Massachusetts and Boston in that huge harbor, the Boston Harbor. And that is why in 1768, the British are going to land two regiments of redcoats to keep the peace there and stop the smuggling. And of course, that leads us to the Boston Massacre. Um, we have a drunken mob of Bostonians that are um, marching through the streets and marching towards a customs house. A customs house is where you um, keep the collected taxes. There is an armed guard at the customs house um, of four British redcoats. And when they see these 60 Bostonians, virtually all of them armed, some of them have rocks in their hands, some snowballs, some guns. Some of them have been drinking or are drunk. Uh, this obviously scares our, our redcoats. And so one of them is going to go and get the lieutenant and ask for reinforcements. Um, the lieutenant is going to arrive as the mob is getting closer and closer to the customs house. And the lieutenant is going to say, on no condition will we fire. We are not going to fire upon this mob. We do not need um, any sort of bad publicity here. Just keep your weapons drawn and keep your ground. Do not fire unless we are in intimate danger or have been fired upon first. And in fact, the lieutenant actually gets in front of his men and says, no, no, do not fire. Do not fire. Um, but very faithfully, one of the redcoats does fire. And this starts off this um, shooting spree in which um, the, the, the men in red fire upon these, this Bostonian mob, um, really in fear of their life. Um, however, when they do this, um, this is going to kill or wound 11 Americans or Bostonians, I should say, one of which was uh, a black man by the name of Crispus Attucks, which is one of our first casualties of this um, pre-American war um, time period. But this becomes a huge politicized event, an event that is going to be taken by American propagandists and used um, very effectively to rise suspicion and anger against the British. As you can see on this picture right here, this is an etching from your very own Paul Revere. He is going to take this event. He is going to manipulate and change it. As you can see from the picture, um, we have this, the British um, lieutenant, no, not in the front, trying to stop his soldiers from fighting and firing, but instead behind, ordering them to fire. They're in a line. They are firing against these colonists over here, all of which unarmed um, and, and being fired upon. Um, Samuel Adams gives this name, the Boston Massacre, and this is going to be circulated throughout um, all of the American colonies. So a disaster for the British in this stage. And that is going to um, bring about this time period between 1770 and 1775, in which the colonies are, are attempting um, to come together um, and, and speak out against British infringements upon their civil liberties. First, the Townsend Acts are repealed. Um, they weren't making any money is really the biggest reason why. But all of these acts are repealed except for one. They keep a three pence tax on tea. So there is still the persistence of a tax on tea. Um, and Samuel Adams is going to organize the first committees of correspondence. Committees of correspondence are within the colonial legislatures. Let's use the House of Burgesses as an example. The House of Burgesses is, is this is a, a colonial government agency that is going to um, speak out within the colony. They're going to exchange letters um, and stories, and they're going to talk about what interactions that each person has had with the um, British government in the colony. And they're going to say, um, are, are your rights being respected? Are you being taxed unfairly? And this is going to keep the spirit of resistance alive um, in the respective colonies. Um, the two places where this is especially going on in Boston and Virginia, um, Boston especially, um, and then 
um, we're going to say, well, why are we only communicating with our own colony if we ever are going to, you know, need to fight against the British? Um, we should do so um, at, together, at intercolonial committees. And so our first intercolonial committee is going to, uh, the House of Burgesses is going to go out and speak with other colonies about problems with the British government. Um, and this is going to evolve directly into our first Continental Congress. Okay, a little context for the Boston Tea Party. So we still have that pers persistent tax on tea, even though the Townsend Tax have been repealed, we still have a tax on tea. But at this stage, tea is very, very cheap. Um, and in fact, even with that three pence tax on tea, legal tea is cheaper than the smuggled tea that people are buying. And yet people are still buying the smuggled tea because of their resistance to British taxes. And then, the British make an economic decision. They are going to grant a monopoly to the British East India Company on selling tea to Amer the American colonies. This is done with the Tea Act. Um, and by giving this monopoly, the British East India Company um, now has all of this tea that it is no longer selling over uh, in India. And in fact, they have 17 million pounds of tea that they desperately need to sell. And so they're going to sell a very, very cheap, a very, very reasonable price for tea to the American colonies. But even though the tea is so cheap, American colonists do not want to buy British seeing that they are being told they have to buy British. Oh, you're going to give a monopoly to the British East India Company, they say. We're going to be no part of that. We're going to continue to buy smuggled tea. And when this law is enacted, the um, leaders of the American resistance, especially Samuel Adams, is going to say this is a trick to get Americans to buy British tea. Um, and when I say Americans, of course, we're all British at this stage, right? Including our American colonists. But our American colonists more and more are starting to define themselves as Americans, even though, of course, they aren't, in fact, um, you know, Americans yet. Now, um, that sets the stage for the Boston Tea Party in 1773. Um, we have these British East India Company ships arriving in harbors all up and down the East American coast, um, all the way up in New York Harbor, all the way down in Charleston, um, where they're arriving to sell tea. Um, in many different harbors, we have active resistance against these ships unloading or offloading their tea. Um, for instance, um, in New York, uh, we see an active protest, yelling, intimidating the ship. The ship isn't even able to make birth. Um, in Maryland, they actually set the ship on fire. They actually burn down the ship. They burn down all of the tea that's on board. Um, so a dramatic, dramatic response. But in Boston, um, we see another very radical response. And the difference between Boston and really the rest of these harbors that are, have these active resistance is that the, the British Crown warned the British East India Company about their response in Boston. They said, we have had lots of problems with Boston. We know that you are going to get some sort of active protest in Boston and we want you to stand firm. We want you to offload that tea onto the Boston shores. Um, we don't want you to leave that harbor until you have offloaded this tea. That is a direct order. And while the other harbors in North America, we see that these these ships are the ship captains are backing down and sailing away. Um, the the uh, official, the the ship captain coming into Boston um, refuses to leave. And so what we have here is a stalemate. We have the Bostonians refusing to allow the ship to offload tea. And then we have a ship's captain that refuses to leave the harbor. And then during the night, a plan is concocted to get rid of this undesired tea on this British East India Company ship. Samuel Adams is going to organize um, a movement in which Bostonians are going to dress up as Native Americans. They are going to board these East India Company ships and they are going to dump the chests of tea into the ocean. They dump in 342 chests of tea. Um, and this is hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of money just flushed into the ocean. Um, and this was, at this point, probably the most radical move that the colonists have done um, yet. This movement here is represents 
um, hundreds of thousands of pounds lost. And that means um, that the Bostonians are going to be held accountable for lots of private property destroyed. In fact, this wasn't uniformly celebrated throughout the colonies. Some colonists thought this was far too radical. Nonetheless, Boston is showing itself that it is the center of the resistance against um, the, the British. And so because of this, the Coercive Acts are passed. Um, the Coercive Acts are the official name. The American colonists call them the Intolerable Acts, and there are four of them, and they're aimed to pu punish Boston and Massachusetts more generally. The most drastic is the Port Act, because the Port Act closes the Port of Boston until the destroyed tea is paid for. And the because of the mercantilist laws, um, the the ports are key to almost every American business. You need to be able to export your goods no matter what you're doing, um, whether you are a lumberer, whether you are a fisherman, whether you are a manufacturer, whether you are a farmer. It doesn't matter. You're exporting goods and you need to use the port. And because the port is closed, this is going to drastically affect the economy of, of Boston in a very bad way. Um, in fact, when this law goes into the first day that it comes into being enacted, we see um, flags throughout the American colonies at half mast and we see food sent to Boston um, to help the Bostonians um, survive while their economy is so badly affected. Um, the other laws that are passed in the Massachusetts Government Act, which is reducing the power of the Massachusetts legislature, we're putting in royal governors in their place. Um, if you have broken a law, royal officials accused of crimes are going to be tried in Great Britain, not in the colonies, and we're bringing more soldiers into private homes with the expansion of the Quartering Act. This is um, kind of drawing a line in the sand, so to speak. And of course, um, our American colonists will take notice. Another law that's enacted with the Intolerable Acts, but not part of the Intolerable Acts, was the Quebec Act. The Quebec Act, Quebec Act doesn't even have to do with the 13 colonies. Um, all this was doing was trying to figure out what to do with that large French population in Canada. Um, when the French were kicked off the continent after the French and Indian War, we saw the British acquired all of this land in Canada and a lot of French population with it. We have a lot of people that are French there. Um, how are we going to rule over these people in Canada? Um, the, the attempt to do so was the Quebec Act. Um, and actually they're doing some things that were very similar to France. They're gonna establish Roman Catholicism as the official religion of Quebec, which makes a lot of sense because France is a heavily Catholic country. England was Anglican, so they were doing this for the French population there. They're also gonna set up a government without a representative assembly or jury system. Now that that's not good for the people there, but this is what was already going on in France. So you're not doing anything different than what's in France. And they're also gonna expand the lands um, that Quebec controls down into what would modern day Minnesota. So they're gonna you know, give this land here. So this doesn't affect our 13 colonies. This is about dealing with the French population in Quebec, but it's gonna upset our colonists all the same. And it's gonna upset them for three reasons. The first is that, okay, now you've added all this land to Quebec. That was land that we could potentially move into. Um, so you're taking away potential land from us. Also, why are you making the official religion of Quebec Roman Catholicism? Our um, American colonists are predominantly Protestant. And then there's the fear, oh no, if you're setting up a government without a representative assembly or jury system, is this what you're going to do in our American colonies? And so the Quebec Act is treated as a fifth intolerable act and must be dealt with. And so we start to see um, some preparations made. The first Continental Congress in 1774, once again, evolving out of those committees of correspondence, um, is going to be our biggest showing of unity yet. 12 out of the 13 colonies have sent delegates, only Georgia missing in this one. Um, and the purpose is to respond to a threat to our American liberties. Um, we've got radical delegates, we've got conservative delegates, um, they are not yet ready to declare a revolution. In no way are they saying we are unloyal to the king, but they are appealing to the king to respect them. They say, please respect our rights. Um, until our rights are respected, we are going to have a complete boycott of British goods. And that was an association called The Association. 
Um, we are not importing your goods. We are not exporting goods to you. And we are not going to consume British goods. That's what the association is. It is um, a economic warfare, um, an embargo, so to speak, with Britain. Um, and they say, if you don't uh, allow us and, and by 1775, um, we are going to meet again. We, we are going to raise money for an official army and navy. That was the declaration of the First Continental Congress. King George is going to take this the opposite way. He is going to say our colonies are in rebellion. He's going to hire 6,000 Hessians, which are German missionaries or to mercenaries to come in and um, be used against the American colonists. Um, and that is going to set up Lexington and Concord. Wow, what an event this is. Um, our first shots of the American Revolution. Um, we have Redcoats marching to Lexington and Concord. They are marching out of Boston, and they are marching for two reasons. Um, one is because the colonists, the militiamen, have gathered together a huge um, stockpile of weapons, and especially gunpowder. Um, also hiding in Lexington and Concord are our revolutionary leaders, Samuel Adams and John Hancock. So this is a very important multi-purpose situation in which the British government is looking to stop the revolution before it starts. Um, but our Bostonians and our Minutemen are ready, as are our Midnight Riders. The very famous poem, um, Hanging the Lanterns from the Old North Church in Boston. Um, we need to be ready for the Redcoats moving. Um, if they are coming by land, you'll put up one lantern. If they are coming by sea, you will give two lanterns, and I will be ready to give that information um, to the people of Lexington and Concord. That is what our Midnight Riders are all about. Um, sure enough, um, two lanterns are raised in the old, old North Church, one by land and two by sea, and on the opposite shore I shall be. And so Paul Revere um, rides through the night, warning the Redcoats are coming, the Redcoats are coming. Um, and so we um, prepare ourselves for the first shots fired. Um, first, over in Lexington, um, Samuel Adams and John Hancock escape um, the this small town of Lexington, a, a suburb of Boston, are going to rally the militiamen um, in an absolute rout. The, the British are going to come in um, with about a thousand redcoats um, lining up against a very small group of militiamen, probably about 30 militiamen. Um, but they say we are not going to back down. We are not going to put down our weapons. Um, and the first shots, it's a massacre at Lexington. Eight Minutemen are killed. No British casualties as the Redcoats continue to march on their way to Concord. But as they march to Concord, the militiamen are gathering from local towns and communities. They are hiding in bushes. They're ambushing the Redcoats along the way. And finally, um, on their way to Concord, 300 casualties are inflicted upon the British um, regiments. And that is going to cause them to retreat back to Boston. The Revolutionary War has begun. Let's go. Okay, but this isn't looking good. The British have a tremendous amount of advantages over the American colonists. Um, for one, a sizable population uh, diversity. Um, 7.5 million English to only 2.5 million Americans. That's three times as many. They have the strongest Navy in the world by far. They have far more monetary wealth. In fact, King George hires another 30,000 Hessians to join. They also have 50,000 loyalists, which is about 16% of the American population um, is going to be fighting for the British king, for his majesty, King George III. Um, this is a minority revolution because while um, there are a minority that are actually fighting for the British, the majority of American people um, aren't ready to fight and take up arms against his majesty. We only have the radical groups that are looking to take up arms and fight against the Redcoats. But the British have weaknesses. One, Ireland, once again, threatening to revolt. Um, and you needed to keep troops back in England to prepare for a revolt right on your doorstep. Um, also, because Britain is 3,000 miles away, um, it takes a long time to bring supplies and weapons and artillery to the front lines. Also, because it takes 
10 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks to be able to bring in military orders. And because military orders were coming from London, these military orders often made no sense when they finally arrived because the military situation changed drastically. Um, the British also only send over their second rate generals. They're not sending over their, 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 um, the generals that are really top class that they're used for battles in Europe right now. Um, and so there are a lot of weaknesses that Britain has. And there's some advantages that the Americans had. Outstanding leadership. George Washington, Georgie Wash, um, an outstanding military general. Um, yes, he was defeated more times um, than he won victories. Um, but of course, he is fighting with a, a massive disparity of, of supplies of weapons and of men. Ben Franklin, not so much a military leader, in fact, not a military leader at all, but a diplomat who perhaps is the most important American besides George Washington in this conflict because he secures um, the alliance with the French. And then Marquis de Lafayette, um, the 19-year-old uh, French general who joins the Americans quite early. He is... Um, very important in preparing the American uh, militiamen for, con for conflicts, but also um, very important in securing aid from the French. Um, of course, we've got minuses as well. The colonies are certainly not united, depending on where the conflict is, is where we are going to see how a colony responds. Also, metallic money is a big problem, and that's because of the Navigation Acts. Because Every time the colonists weren't allowed to produce any sort of manufactured goods that were going to compete with British industries like textiles. That meant that if you wanted to buy British textiles, you were going to if you wanted any sort of textiles, you would have to buy from the British. And the British wanted hard money. They wanted to be paid in gold and silver and copper. And that meant that all of the money that all the hard money that was in the Americas was making its way over to Britain. And because of this, there wasn't a lot of hard money in the Americas. And if you don't have hard money to back paper currency, then your paper currency isn't worth anything. And that's what happens with our first paper currency called Continentals. Um, you have to pay your soldiers to fight in the army. Um, and of course, we see some massive inflation because of this. Individual states start printing their own currency. That creates even more confusion. And so money right from the get-go is a big problem with our Americans. The American military is in a similar, very disorganized boat. Um, oftentimes, the colonists relied on Britain for troops and weapons, especially weapons. Um, and all of these manufactured goods. And when you say manufactured goods, you're also you're talking about guns and rifles, of course, but you're also talking about uniforms, right? We need to have all of these things to have a competent army. And yet, right from the get-go, the American army now cut off from their supply of British goods, have shortages of gunpowder, of cannons, of ships, clothing, uniforms, food, all of these things. And there's also the issue of profiteering. Um, even in Boston, um, because so much wealth can be made by illegal trade with the British, we do see profiteering rearing its ugly head. I'll give you an example on that. When the British troops arrive, the Redcoats arrive, um, you know, they're 3,000 miles away from their next meal. They've got to, they've got to wait until food arrives um, to be able to eat and survive and wait for more gunpowder, what have you. Um, of course, if you can get food from the American colonies, that's going to be a much more reliable source of food. And the British soldiers have gold. And our, um, you know, food producers in Pennsylvania, for instance, or in New York, which is very aristocratic, or down in South Carolina, um, which is also very aristocratic, and therefore um, more loyalists are going to be there. They're going to be much more likely to give food to the British Army because they're paying in gold, right? Um, Towards the end of the war, um, we finally get a sizable standing trained army um, and, and not just a militia. Um, 7,000 man army finally whipped into shape by Barn von Steuben, who was a, a, a German um, taskmaster, a, a, a drill master, if you will. Um, okay, so the War for Independence, here we go. So Lexington and Concord happens in 1775. In 1775, um, 
in May, so Lexington the Concords in April, uh, in May, we have the Second Continental Congress. George Washington is selected as the commander in chief. We're raising an army, we're raising a navy. But even as late as July of 1775, we are still trying to declare loyalty to the crown. We are still, we're trying to go over the prime minister's head and we're trying to reach King George himself and say, we are still loyal to you. Stop Parliament from doing these things. Respect our rights, and we will put down our arms. This is 14 months. Um, you know, we we have we are coming in, and we have started to um, engage in these conflicts. By the time we sign the Declaration of Independence, it's we've been fighting for 14 months. This Olive Branch petition um, is coming in after two major battles. Um, Lexington and Concord, and then the Battle of Bunker Hill, which was actually fought on Breed's Hill. So um, this is late in the game, you know, July of 1775. Okay, um, two reasons, um, two major, um, you know, it, written things that are going to influence the American Revolution. Uh, the first is common sense. Common sense is written actually by a British revolutionary named Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine is going to come over from Britain. He believes that the British monarchy is corrupt. Uh, he calls King George III the royal brute of Britain. And in his pamphlet, Common Sense, he is going to explain why it is common sense in very simple language that they... American colonists should not be ruled by a small island 3,000 miles away. He also is going to put in a plea for a republic, for a representative government. Um, and this is going to um, bring the average and very moderate American into a more radical approach to um, going to war with King George it is read or read to virtually every American colonist, and this is going to be um, an unprecedented propaganda piece um, in American history. Also, the Declaration of Independence, of course, um, July 4, 1776, written by 33-year-old Thomas Jefferson, a Virginia lawyer. Um, he is going to draw upon ideas of the Enlightenment. Humankind has natural rights, which he takes right from John Locke. All men are created equal, he says. He then goes on to list a series of tyrannical misdeeds by King George III. Um, let's see. What, oh, my, uh, my phone just thought I said... Siri. I said series, series. So back off. Um, of course, the Declaration of Independence is, uh, well, it's a bit hypocritical in a number of different ways. All men are created equal. And of course, also having slaves in the Americas. Um, in fact, of course, Virginia lawyer Thomas Jefferson himself had many slaves. Okay. Um, our British loyalists, um, we talked about 16% of Americans were loyalists. Um, where are these loyalists mostly taking place or where are they mostly found? They're found where the Anglican church is the strongest. And that of course makes sense because um, the Anglican church um, worships the king as the head of the church and therefore there's a religious tie that way. So as you get further south, you'll see more loyalists, especially in places like South Carolina where we have the most aristocrats, the most conservatives. Um, loyalists had to flee largely if they were intimidated by the um, American militia. Some left back to Britain um, and Tories estates, Tories of course is our loyalists, um, were sold to finance the war for our American colonists. Lots of cool battles in this one, guys, but the only one that we need to know, we actually need to know too, um, but the most important battle of this war takes place early on in 1777, um, in which the British general surrenders to Horatio Gates in 1777. Um, ben Franklin is already over in France trying to negotiate a French alliance with the Americans. Um, However, the French are unwilling to dip their feet in if, unless the Americans can show a, a chance of winning this war. Um, after the Battle of Saratoga, um, this shows the French that, in fact, the Americans have a chance of winning this war, and they are going to um, accept Ben Franklin's request to join the war at a chance to hurt 
their old foe, the English, of course, who just pushed them off of the continent themselves. And so um, now we have a world war on our hands. France allies with the United States. Once again, Spain comes in and allies with France. And so now we have France and Spain fighting against the British. And now Russia, under Catherine the Great, now looks at this as an opportunity to challenge British supremacy of the seas. Britain has been very heavy handed in controlling trade in Europe with its unbeatable navy. And so Russia is going to organize something called the armed neutrality, which is a bunch of different European neutral nations that are saying we are going to come together and fight the British Navy if we need to, to be able to come in and trade in Europe and, and stop this monopoly of the British um, in seagoing maritime trade. So now England is at war with the Americans. France, Spain, Holland, and now it's got all these challenges to its navy. Um, you know, obviously our American colonists could not have defeated Britain head to head, one on one, but they aren't fighting one on one. And French aid, of course, being the most important. Um, how was it important? They provided guns, money, huge amounts of equipment, half of America's armed forces and practically all of America's Navy. You guys know the quote, I'll say it again, to say that the Americans defeated Britain with a little help from France is like saying, daddy and I killed the bear and the French are daddy. My wife liked that one, nice. Okay, um, Indians in the war. Um, we saw the British actively trying to recruit um, Indian groups to fight against the Americans. And largely that was an easy sell to Indian groups because the thought process is if you allow the Americans to win this war, they're going to continue to expand West. We, the British government, try to stop them. We have that proclamation line of 1763. Um, and if you, you know, side with us, we'll continue to, to hold them on the Eastern seaboard. But if the Americans win this war, they're going to continue to expand. And largely that rationale made sense. And many of uh, Indian groups are going to fight with the British. In fact, the Iroquois were so divided, these six tribes that have been together for so long, but four of the tribes are going to side with the British. Um, after the war, 1784, we see our first treaty signed between the U.S. as an independent nation and an Indian nation. That's the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, where the Iroquois have to move off of their land and give their land to the Americans. Battle of Yorktown is the other key battle that we need to know, guys. Um, Washington is going to march 300 miles to engage Cornwallis by land, and the French are going to come in and defeat him by sea. Cornwallis has to surrender all 7,000 of his men. This is the last major battle of the war. The war is won officially in 1783. Another Treaty of Paris. Yes, the Treaty of Paris signed um, at the end of the French and Indian War, and yes, signed at the end of the American Revolutionary War. The most important thing is that the Americans get their independence. They also get an immense amount of land all the way over to the Mississippi River um, and all the way up into present day Canada. And um, the Spanish are going to get Florida um, in compensation. All right, guys, your partnered SAQ that you guys are working on um, together. Identify one way the American colonists protested new taxes placed upon them by the British after the French and Indian War. Protested new taxes. Okay. B, identify one key factor in the American victory over Britain in the Revolutionary War. One key factor in the American victory over Britain. Okay, cool. And then C, identify one non-economic factor that influenced the American colonists to rebel against the British. Cool. Got some good SAQ questions. Um, do these with your partner, guys. I um, hope you enjoyed our revolutionary screencast. This is Mr. Hill ending conversations. Um, have a great weekend, guys.